Meet William Joyce, known as Lord Haw Haw, Britain's greatest radio traitor. William Joyce is best known today for turning his back on Britain during the Second World War and broadcasting Nazi propaganda to millions of Allied citizens. As the gallows loomed closer and closer for Lord Haw Haw, he would say, the people of England will curse themselves for having preferred ruin from Churchill to peace from Hitler. These were among various bitter utterings Lord Haw Haw gave during his time, acting on behalf of the Nazis. Unlike others who repented in an attempt to save themselves, Joyce remained defiant to the end. But where did the story of the man who would become known as Lord Haw Haw begin? It may surprise you to learn that his story didn't begin in Britain. Instead, Joyce was born in New York City. His father was a naturalized American citizen born in Ireland, then part of the British Empire. Likewise, his mother, Gertrude Emily Brooke, hailed from an Anglo-Irish family. Joyce's beginnings in New York City swiftly came to an end at the age of three when the family relocated to Galway on the west coast of Ireland. It was a turbulent time for Ireland after World War I, as the Irish War of Independence broke out in 1919 when Joyce was just 13. During the war, Joyce found himself recruited by Captain Patrick William Keating of the British Army to serve as a courier for the Army's contacts stationed throughout the county. Despite only being in his mid-teens, the Irish Republican Army already knew Joyce to be working as an informant, selling out Irish patriots to the British authorities. Luckily, Captain Keating didn't abandon the teenage Joyce to his fate. Instead, he arranged for him to be transferred to the Worcester Regiment, located at the Norton Barracks in England. This decision would ultimately save Joyce's life. Had he remained in Ireland, he would have almost certainly been killed. Although Joyce escaped this time, he was discharged from the army a few months following his arrival in England, after it was discovered he was underage. In all probability, Captain Keating likely knew Joyce was underage in the first place. After being discharged from the army, Joyce attended both King's College School and Birkbeck College in London. While in the officer training corps at the latter, Joyce received a first-class honours degree in English. It's said that it was during this period in his life that Joyce acquired his interest in fascism and the growing British fascist movement. For now, Joyce lived a relatively mundane existence in England, working as a teacher after being rejected by the UK Foreign Office. But his first brush with the realities of the extremist politics of the 1920s and 30s would come to define him. On the 22nd of October 1924, Joyce acted as a steward at a meeting for the Conservative Party candidate Jack Lazarus. He would be subsequently attacked by a group of communists who slashed him across the right cheek. The scar would leave Joyce permanently disfigured from earlobe to mouth, with the incident cementing Joyce's hatred for communists and Jews. However, although it's certain that his attackers were communists, it's not known whether they were Jewish. According to historian Colin Holmes, Joyce's first wife told him that it wasn't a Jewish communist who disfigured him, he was knifed by an Irish woman. Regardless, with his face scarred for life, Joyce deeply embedded himself in the rising fascist movement in Britain. Eight years after he was slashed across the face, he joined the British Union of Fascists, led by Sir Oswald Mosley in 1932. At this time, Joyce was something of a rising star, known for his excellent speaking skills. According to journalist Cecil Roberts, who had watched one of his speeches, he described him as thin, pale, intense. He had not been speaking many minutes before we were electrified by this man. But unlike Hitler in Germany, who was just a speaker, Joyce further distinguished himself as a ferocious brawler, willing to jump into the fray whenever possible. Despite men like Joyce, the British fascists never enjoyed a leader who won the same blind devotion as Hitler. Sir Oswald Mosley came the closest, but he never succeeded in unifying the movement or claiming any degree of political power. By 1937, a disappointing round of elections and ideological disputes saw Mosley remove Joyce from the party. In response, he established the National Socialist League, which was far more anti-Semitic than the British Union of Fascists. Joyce held many of the same views as the Nazis at this time, but he believed in a different model for Britain. In a quote from Joyce, he said, I would gladly say Heil Hitler and at once part company with him, realizing what a pitiable insult it is to such a great man to try to flatter him with such an imitation which he has always disdained. His way is for Germany, ours is for Britain. But Joyce's view didn't hold for long. 
By the outbreak of World War II, the other leaders of the National Socialist League had decided to model the party on German Nazism. Bitter and angry, Joyce dissolved the party and turned to alcoholism. Joyce quickly fled to Germany on a British passport he'd obtained falsely the previous year. Technically an American-Irish citizen, Joyce used the document to travel to Berlin. He would become a naturalized citizen of the Third Reich in 1940. It would be this ploy to escape British detention and move to Germany that would eventually kill him. Initially, Joyce struggled to find employment, but chance favored him, and he won a radio audition via the wife of an old ally in the British Union of Fascists. He was also lucky that Germany happened to be searching for allied citizens to broadcast propaganda at the time. After a successful audition, he was given his own radio show known as Germany Calling. During this initial year of World War II, before the fall of France and the Blitz, British listeners actually enjoyed his show as entertainment. The British press also enjoyed his sarcastic, sneering character, which is where he acquired the name Lord Haw Haw. It was estimated at this time that his words reached 6 million regular listeners and 18 million occasional listeners across the country. Joseph Goebbels himself mentioned Joyce specifically, writing in his diary, I tell the Fuhrer about Lord Haw Haw's success, which is really astonishing. His achievements brought him not just fame, but also a pay rise, the title of Chief Commentator of the English Language Service and the War Merit Cross from Hitler. However, Joyce himself never met Hitler in person. But this success and recognition would only last for so long. Once Germany moved to bombing Britain's cities, listeners gradually tuned out as Joyce's broadcasts were exposed not as entertainment, but as genuine threats. Joyce himself was moved from city to city to avoid bombing raids on Germany, before settling in Hamburg, where he would remain until the end of the war. In May 1945, an audibly drunk and rambling Joyce gave his final broadcast before being captured by British forces. Like other traitors, he would be transported back to England and put on trial for high treason. Although many legal experts have since argued that he never fell under British jurisdiction due to his American and Irish heritage, the decision to lie to obtain his British passport damned him. The court ignored the fact he was born in New York City, grew up in Ireland, or was a naturalized citizen of Germany. They only saw the British passport he had possessed between the summer of 1939 and 1940. He was soon found guilty and sentenced to death. If Lord Haw Haw had never obtained a British passport, there is a high likelihood that he would have escaped the death penalty entirely. Supposedly, his final words were, I am proud to die for my ideals and I am sorry for the sons of Britain who have died without knowing why. Whether you think Britain was right to sentence him to death or even whether the man deserved to die at all, Joyce was a man of contradictions. While a fascist at heart, he always showed his contentedness to adopt a fluid position whenever it suited him. Regardless, we can all agree that Lord Haw Haw chose the side of evil whether you think of him as an American, an Irishman, an Englishman, or a German. Joyce would go to his grave unrepentant, forever securing his reputation as Britain's most famous Second World War traitor. So there we have it. If you have any comments, criticisms, or corrections, let me know in the comments, and I'll see you in the next video.